Hey, um, I haven't said this in a long time. I believe it to be true. One of the ways in which you can sense a revival, getting ready to break out in a movement, it, see, just that excitement right there, but that's not even where I'm going. It is the volume level at which folks worship their God. There's, some, there's a corresponding connection, L.A., between how a people worship God, how they sing to God and what God is about to do in our midst. Come on now, come on. If you believe revival is on the horizon, let me hear you church, let me hear you church. Last week, last week I sat right up here and I told you God had given me a word for this church in the next season. You remember what it was? Change. On the count of three, say it out loud. One, two, three, change. Change is in the air up in this place and I praise God for what he is doing. Come on now. pray together. Come on, all heads bow. Let's just, just cry out for revival. Pray to God. Father, we love you today. Father, we thank you for what you are doing in our midst. God, I can speak on behalf of Amy Lynn and myself. We have never sensed so deeply in the very core of our being, God, that you are unleashing revival in our midst. You are unleashing great anointing in our midst. You are unleashing unparalleled favor in our midst, Father God. And we want to thank you and we want to humbly pray, oh God, that you would continue to bring it in the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for 17 years of new hope. But Lord, we firmly believe that in and through you, we have not seen anything yet, Father God. We praise you, we exalt you, and we worship you. Lord, we're faithful enough to praise you even in advance. We believe by faith, Lord God, that our best days are ahead. We give you all honor, we give you all glory, and we thank you for the never-ending, reckless love of God. In Jesus' name. Let me hear you, church. Let me hear you, church. Y'all about fired up, aren't you? Praise his holy name. You can be seated. Wow. God is good. Uh, all the time. Hey, um, would you help me just welcome all of our campuses? You know who they are. We are one church in 10 locations, online community. Come on, just celebrate at all of our campuses. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Monday night crowd, welcome. We love you guys. Um, hey, just a couple of quick things, and I'm telling you, you came to church on an amazing day. You are in for a treat. But first things first, today is Super Bowl. And I know it's already been mentioned, and some of you don't give a flying flip about football, and that's okay. We're not gonna, we're not gonna belabor the point. Um, but like, if, if, I just wanna give you a warning. Like, if you came today with a New York, I mean, with a um, Boston, uh, New England Patriots jersey, no, 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 no. I've already told security they're going to escort you out. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just letting you know. Uh, no, we're, we're not going to do that. We're just kidding. Um, but I did want to tell you, I know you all brought a bunch of cans of non-perishable soup items and food items so we can feed uh, the hungry. And uh, we're excited about that. But it happens every year. Some of you show up and you're like, oh, I forgot. No worries. You can bring them up through the worship concert Wednesday night. And guys, I'm telling you, if you've never been to one of our nights of worship, you need to come this Wednesday at what time? 7 p.m. All of our worship pastors from all of our campuses get on this stage and we just worship God. And uh, I'll bring a little word. I'll keep unpacking a little bit this whole concept of change that's on the horizon. And uh, you don't want to miss that. That's this Wednesday. Um, hey, grab your teaching notes. Grab your pen. I can say this because I've already sat through a message and I've got a page full of notes. You are in for a special, special treat today. 
I hope you know that anytime I have a guest speaker on this stage, here's my commitment to you. I will always bring in some of the best speakers I can possibly bring in. I know pastors who, when they get a guest speaker, they bring in a mediocre guest speaker so that they can follow that guest speaker next week and feel good about themselves. I'm not even kidding. I will always bring in the very best I can find. And I knew this woman, hello, women. I knew this woman of God was anointed. I just didn't know how timely, how timely of a message she was bringing to the New Hope house today. I first heard about her from my friend, your friend. He's, he's preached here several times, Pastor Derwin Gray from Transformation Church in Charlotte. And Derwin and I talk on a regular basis and he just kept going, dude, you, you gotta bring Sheila up in the New Hope house. And so we've been trying to make this happen for a while, Barry. This is her husband. Will you give Barry some love? Her husband's on the front row right here. Thank you, Barry. But Derwin was like, you gotta get her in the house. And we've been planning it for about, it seems like a year or so now. But let me tell you a little bit about Sheila. She is a Scottish woman who loves to teach God's word to people. And in fact, she has spoken to over six million people around the globe. She loves making the Bible practical and relevant and sharing her own story. And you're gonna hear parts of her story today that I'm venturing to guess you will never forget. She loves to communicate the fact, listen, and some of you have never really even marinated in this for a moment. God is for you. Some of you think God is against you. And I apologize on behalf of pastors or parents or churches who have ever taught you that. God is for you. Look at your neighbor and say, God is for you. God is for you. Now check this out. Sheila also enjoys being an author. In fact, she likes to write every day. And she has sold more than five million books. Her newest book in 2018 and what she's talking to you about today is titled, and I love this. I wish I had grabbed this before she did. It's okay to not be okay. And I wish I could tell you that we have uh, copies available to show you how good this message was. They sold out in like 10 minutes after the first celebration. Sorry, but they've made it available. You can go on Amazon, you can get these books. And uh, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you don't want to miss it. And the book comes with an eight week Bible study that I, you're gonna be able to tap in, I think through Amazon or let us know. We'll give you a passcode. The code is Sheila, if you wanna go ahead and write that down to get that eight week uh, Bible study. She calls Texas home. Any Texas people in the house? Texas forever, clear eyes, clear eyes, there's my people, clear eyes, full heart, what? Can't lose, Texas forever, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just got all wrapped up into Friday Night Lights, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> she's married to her husband, Barry, and um, just an amazing, amazing couple, and they have uh, one boy, which you might hear about, and two little puppy dogs for you dog lovers. Um, hey, get ready, grab your pen, lean in, and do what you always do, New Hope. Welcome the woman of God into the house of God to preach the word of God to you and me, the people of God. Give it up for her. Good morning, Pastor Benji is hilarious. I'm so grateful um, to be in this house though, to see what God is doing. And hi to all of you on different campuses. You're looking lovely, speaking that in faith, knowing it to be true, but it's really a joy to be here. I'm, I'm very excited at what God is doing in and through this family. And I believe you are just on the brink, the tipping point of seeing amazing things that God is gonna do in and through you, and I'm, I'm excited. Um, Pastor Benji told you I'm from Scotland, which explains a funny accent. And um, if I'm new to you, I brought a photo of my family, so you can see my husband and my son. <clears throat> that's, yep, that's our son, Christian. He's 22, senior at Texas A&M. Just one of the 
kindest, most godly, hilarious, wonderful human beings on the planet. If you have a single daughter, I'm taking reservations. So, <laughs> and yes, we also have two daughters. That's our girls. They look just like their father. <laughs> yeah. Super Bowl Sunday. Woo! And now my husband and I, we are a house divided. We're, se we're supporting separate teams. And he told me that I cannot say which team I am supporting. I'll just say it rhymes with hams. But that's all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Should be a great day. Um, there's three things that over the last however many years, I gave my life to Christ when I was 11 and I'm now 62. That is 51 years of the faithfulness of God. 51 years of me falling down and God picking me up again. 51 years of leaning on the promises of God and discovering that they will hold you fast in the middle of a storm. But I wanted just to share three things that I have learned that I believe as deep as the marrow in my bones, but they didn't come easily. They were fought for. First thing is this, God is in control no matter how things appear. God is in control. He is still on the throne, no matter how things appear or what other people say. One of the first verses I ever learned as a child growing up in a small fishing town on the west coast of Scotland is a very familiar text. Romans chapter eight, verse 28 says this, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. It doesn't say that all things feel good. It doesn't say that all things are good. There are things that happen that we know are not good. But what it says is that God, almighty God, who is still on the throne, causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose for them. I was brought up in a small fishing town on the west coast of Scotland. Um, my mom and dad didn't just go to church, they loved Jesus, which wouldn't be unusual in a lot of towns and cities in America. But I don't know if you realize this, less than 4% of the entire population of Scotland even go to church. And that's not saying how many of those are committed to following Christ. Char Scotland is now a largely unchurched nation. So to be placed in a home where my mom and dad didn't just take us to church, but modeled the love of Christ for us Monday through Saturday night was a real gift. I have a sister who's two years older than me, and she's kind of what every mother hopes for. You know, she liked to wear all those sticky outy dresses and ribbons. And I was very much a tomboy and I just thought there was nobody on this earth like my dad. Tall and strong and had a voice like an angel. In fact, when I was back in Scotland a couple of years ago for my mom's memorial service, a man that I'd never met in my life before came up and said, I gave my life to Christ one night listening as your dad sang about him. So it was a real gift. But when I was five years old, everything in our family changed drastically. I don't know if you remember the movie, The Wizard of Oz, remember that movie? And there's a scene before Dorothy is transported into the wonderful world of Oz, when she's standing in this bleak landscape in Kansas, and she's looking out and she sings that song that's so familiar. Somewhere over the rainbow, there's a place where every dream that you dare to dream will come true. Well, Dorothy has no way of knowing it's not a rainbow that's heading for her. It's a tornado. Have you ever been there? Just out of nowhere? Something you weren't expecting, something you didn't sign up for? Something suddenly hits your life and changes the landscape and nothing is ever quite the same again. And that's what happened in our family. It was really close to Christmas and all I wanted for Christmas was a dog. 
I've always loved dogs. So I said to my dad, Dad, do you think for Christmas I could just have a dog? And he said, well, honey, your mom's got three of you under seven at the moment. Maybe next year. I was like, oh, Dad, please, a wee dog, a three-legged dog, any kind of dog. And he said, well, leave it to me. So a couple of nights later, my dad came into the bedroom and he was holding something behind his back. And he said to my sister and I, okay, I have an early Christmas gift and it's alive. So close your eyes and hold out your hands. Well, my sister wouldn't do it, but I did. But the minute my dad put whatever it was in my hands, it ran up the sleeve of my pajamas. And I thought, I don't know what that is. But I thought, well, it's got a tail and I'm giving it a name. And it turned out to be a little wiener dog, a little dachshund. Yeah, I mean, perfect. Just one of those times in life where you think everything has fallen into place. Everything's great. I had no idea that although I might have been dreaming on a rainbow that night, a tornado was about to hit our family. By the time we woke up the next morning, my dad was in intensive care and not expected to survive. But he'd had a massive brain aneurysm. But after a few weeks, he made enough of a recovery to come home. And my mom explained to my sister and I, my baby brother was too little, she explained that he'd had a massive stroke. He was now paralyzed down one side and he couldn't speak. But I thought, I don't care, he's my dad and he's coming home. And I thought, I will just learn his new language. Whatever sounds he makes, I'll learn what he means. Which worked until it didn't anymore. And his anger and his violence towards me started in little ways. Interestingly enough, until the last day, he never touched my mom or my sister or my brother. The only person he took his rage out on was me which was confusing to me because I thought I was closest to my dad. A few years ago, a friend of mine who's a neurosurgeon explained that sometimes when there's an extreme brain injury, the person instinctively hits out at the one person they believe will love them no matter what. But you don't understand that when you're five. I would walk past his chair and he would spit in my face. And then he began to, he would reach, grab hold of my hair and pull up a handful. Or with his good arm, he would punch me. And I never told my mom, because I thought, I'm doing something wrong. I have to try harder. But the last day I ever saw my dad, I was sitting by the fire, playing with my little dog. And she started to growl. And the hair on the back of her neck stood up. And I turned just in time to see that my dad was about to bring his cane down on my skull. And I don't remember whether I pushed him or pulled his cane, but he lost his balance and he hit the ground hard and just lay there roaring like an animal. And I remember looking in his eyes and all I could see was absolute hatred. My mom heard what was happening and she took my sister and my brother and I and she locked us in a room while she dialed 911. As I say, we lived in a little fishing village. It probably only took three or four minutes for help to get there but it felt like a lifetime. I stood with my ear to the door and I could hear my dad banging my mom's head off one wall and off the other wall. And I thought he was gonna kill her and I couldn't help. It took five men to carry my dad out of the house that day. And he was taken to what was called in those days, our local lunatic asylum. It's what we call a psych hospital these days. He was 34 years old. But because he was becoming increasingly violent, they placed him in the maximum security ward. And all the men in there were in their 70s and 80s and really had lost touch with reality. So my mom asked my dad's doctor, could you perhaps put Frank in a unit with some younger men? Which they did, but it was a less secure ward. And my dad managed to escape. And they searched for him through the night and they found him just as dawn was breaking. He had drowned himself in the river and was caught in the fishing nets. And in those days, you didn't take children to a funeral or to a gravesite. All I remember is my mom coming home in a black dress with a black hat on, and she took every single photograph of my father off the walls and off the table, and she placed them in a little suitcase, which she locked, and she pushed it under her bed, and we never mentioned his name again. I think she thought, if Sheila wants to talk about what happened, I'll let her. She had no idea the question that would torment me for the next 20, 30 years. 
What did my dad see in me that made him hate me so much? You know, it's interesting. If we had time, all the campuses and here, to hear a little bit of every one of your stories, because we all have one. And I don't know what your childhood looked like. Perhaps it wasn't physical abuse like mine. Perhaps it was sexual abuse, which leaves such a stain on your soul. And you think, no matter how hard I scrub, I will never get this out. Perhaps it was verbal abuse. Now, I was speaking at a conference in Los Angeles, and a gentleman came up to me at the end, and I knew who he was, because I'd been reading Time magazine on the way out there, and he was in it, one of the richest men in America. And he said to me, you know, um, I don't know if you know who I am. And I said, actually, I was just reading about you. And he said, well, what the magazine will never tell you is that every night when I put my head on the pillow, I hear my mother's voice saying, I wish you'd never been born. Having you ruined my health. You know, children are the best recorders of information. You can think they're not listening. They're missing nothing but they are the poorest interpreters of that information. Children always think it's something I did. And when you don't know what to do with that kind of pain, you just push it into the cellar of your soul and you find some way of going on, some mask to wear. You know, sometimes we turn to, to drugs, you know, street drugs or prescription medication, anything just to numb the pain. We turn to alcohol or relationships. Sometimes as women, we spend too much money because we think, if I just look better on the outside, maybe I'll feel better on the inside. It doesn't work, but we find it hard to change. Well, I found the perfect place to hide. Christian ministry. I mean, think about it. Who's going to come up to me and say, put that Bible down or we're going to have an intervention? No more second kings for you, lady. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But God's the only one who knows. If we're genuinely serving for a passion for him or a pain inside, we don't know where else to hide. If it's an absolute calling or just an escape where we wear a good face. You know, in here, wherever campus you're on, it should be the most honest, transparent place of our whole life. But so often, you know, you have some argument with your husband or your wife or your kids on the way to church. You call them things that are not in the New Testament. <laughs> they may have been in the old, but they didn't make it into the New Covenant. And then we come through those doors and people are like, hey, how are you doing? And you're like, I'm so close to Jesus, I'm nearly flying. Here's the thing though, God knows the truth. You see, every one of us, whether you're eight or 80, every one of us longs to be fully known and fully loved. But we're so afraid if we're fully known that we won't be loved. So desperate for love, we trade away being known. It's a lonely place to live. One of the things that I know I used to believe is this. When things were going well, I felt that God loved me. But when things were hard, I felt alone. But the unfolding that was about to take place in my life showed me he is always, always near. Which leads me to this second thing that I believe. God is with you even when you can't see his plan. God is always with you even when you can't see his plan. The book of Philippians is just, it's the most lovely letter to read. If you haven't read it in a while, do yourself a favor and just sit down and read it as a letter. It is absolutely dripping with joy. And what's interesting to me about that is that Paul is in shackles as he writes. He's in prison. He's waiting to hear, am I going to be released or am I going to be executed? Am I going to be beheaded? 
But some of the people have, in Philippi are worried about him. He's in Rome and they've written and they said, listen, because you need to remember, this is before Twitter. This is before Instagram and Facebook and they just hear Paul's in jail and they're totally panicking. And Paul writes to them to say, hey, listen, you need to know, God's in this. This is all working for good. But then he says this in Philippians 1, 5 and 6. And the word he uses for certain here, the Greek word that you would use if you were presenting evidence to the Supreme Court, it is irrefutable. So he says, in chains, and I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. I knew the verse, but I didn't get it. See, what he's saying is, God started the work in you. In your life, this was God's idea. He started it and he will continue until it's done. But I thought it was all up to me. When I was 11 years old, my mom took me to hear Scotland's only gospel group. They were awful. But what I do remember is this. <laughs> the guy at the end, who was amazing, said, God has no grandchildren. He only has sons and daughters. And just because your parents are Christians doesn't mean you are. You get to choose for yourself. And people went forward that night. I couldn't move. I was shaken to my core. So when I got home, I said to my mom, do I, I, want, I want to know Jesus like that. Do I have to wait till Sunday? And my mom assured me God was open 24 seven. So she led me into relationship with Christ. But she said something that would be good news to almost everybody. But have you noticed that son, as you hear what people say through the broken window of your own experience? She said, Sheila, not only is Christ your savior and you get to make him Lord of every area of your life, you have a heavenly father watching over you. And I remember at 11 thinking, wow, I've got one more chance to get it right. Whatever my earthly dad saw in me that made him hate me, my heavenly father is never gonna see. I am going to be the perfect Christian if it kills me. And it nearly did. I went to seminary in London to train to be a missionary, but God redirected my steps. I ended up working with Youth for Christ. Then I was a contemporary Christian artist. Then I came to America and I was working with Billy Graham in lots of his crusades. In fact, I'd actually been at a crusade in Canada and when I came back home, there was a message on my answering machine from someone who said that she represented the 700 Club and could I fly in and co-host for three days? Well, I'd never heard of that. We didn't have any Christian television um, in Scotland and I hadn't been in the States long. So I thought, well, I better find out what it is before I say yes. So I flicked through channels till I found it. Now, at that point, I had short spiky hair and I wore, le actually, I still wear leather pants, forget that bit. I had short spiky <laughs> hair. And I'm watching the program and thinking, I do not have the wardrobe for that. So I went to the mall, and I don't know if this ever made its way to the Carolinas. If it did, I apologize. It's called Laura Ashley. God bless you. Just think flowers, flowers, and a few more flowers. So I went to the store, and I said, I have an emergency. I need three Christian dresses, and I need them quick. And unfortunately, they knew exactly what I meant and produced them. So I bought them, and I flew to Virginia Beach. And the next morning, I met Pat Robertson five minutes before we're live across America. They mic'd us up and took us to studio with cameras and lights and a studio audience and sat me down beside him and began this countdown, five, four, three. I have never prayed so fervently for the return of Christ in my life <laughs> as I did that morning. And for the first few minutes, Pat was talking to a reporter in Washington, so kind of ignoring me. And I stayed quiet, and then he turned and asked me a question. <sighs> he said, Sheila, what is your perspective of the current situation on the West Bank? <laughs> my mind was a total blank. Unfortunately, my lips kept moving. <laughs> and what I said was, oh, I'm with the Bank of America.
Fortunately, he thought I was trying to be funny, which I was not. And that day, you know, um, he and his wife took me out for lunch and said, well, you clearly have a lot of work to do, but we believe you're the person that God has prepared. So for five years, I sat every day, live television, and talked about the love of God. Talked about the fact you come as you are. Talked about the mercy of God. But inside, I was still the same scared little broken girl who wouldn't let anybody get close to her in case you saw what my father saw. Do you know it's possible to be very well known and desperately lonely? I mean, if you'd asked the staff, they would have said, oh, she looks great, yeah. They had no idea that I was literally hanging by a thread. Until one day on a show, my guest didn't answer my first question. She kind of turned the tables and said, Sheila, you sit here every day asking us questions. How are you doing? And I wasn't expecting it. And I didn't have time to pull up that wall. And there was such kindness in her eyes. And it was as if she just took the first brick out the wall. And I fell apart. And I started to cry and I couldn't stop. Eventually our director threw to a commercial break and I took off my microphone and I walked out the studio and I locked myself in my dressing room. And as far as I was concerned, my life was over. See, I based my whole relationship with God and me being good enough, me getting all right. And then I fell apart. I called a friend of mine, a guy called Dr. Henry Cloud, and said, I think I'm losing my mind. And he said, no, you're not, but you need some help and you need it quickly. And by that evening, I was in the locked ward of a psychiatric hospital, same age as my dad. Diagnosed with severe clinical depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. A young nurse took me to a room that would be my home for the next month. Went through all my stuff. Took away my hair dryer, belt, hose, anything you could hurt yourself with. And said, someone will check on you every 15 minutes during the night. And I'll never forget, I didn't get in the bed. I sat in the corner of the room with a blanket. And I thought, how did I go from being co-host of the 700 Club in the morning. And by that evening, I'm in the locked ward of a psychiatric hospital and I'm on suicide watch. I sat with my head on my knees all night. I didn't look up. I could hear people at the door, but I didn't look up. But at three o'clock in the morning, I had an encounter with an angel. I'm never aware of it happening before or since, but I don't have a doubt. The person who came in didn't stay at the door. They walked all the way to where I was. And when I saw their feet, by my feet, I looked up. It didn't look like an angel. It looked like maybe a doctor going off duty. But he was holding something and he gave it to me. It was like something you'd give a child. It was a little stuffed lamb. And we walked to the door and he stopped and turned around and he just said one thing. He said, Sheila, the shepherd knows where to find you. And then he was gone. The shepherd knows where to find you. There is no hole too deep. There is no night too dark. There's no place where you can go that the shepherd does not know where to find you. And if you think, you may be tempted to think, well, you don't understand, you don't know my story. You ended up in that place, really no choice of your own. And maybe you're thinking, I'm living in a hell right now that nobody knows about, but I chose it. Perhaps you're in an extramarital affair, or maybe you're using drugs, or maybe you're back in the bottle again, or whatever it is, but you clean up for a Sunday and you think, there's no mercy for me. I just want you to know, the message of the Word of God is this, the shepherd knows where to find you. I don't care how you got to the place where you are. I just want you to know you have a shepherd who there is no shadow he won't light up. There is no mountain he won't climb up coming after you. There's no wall he won't kick down. There's no lie he won't tear down coming after you. God loves you just as you are at this moment. He knows everything. How would you have felt if when you came in this morning, we said, okay, slight change of plan. Instead of having a guest speaker, we're actually gonna show a movie of your life. Everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said, unedited. 
The things you think, well, that's not technically a sin because I just thought about it. I didn't actually do it. But it's all up there for everyone to see. How would that make you feel? Here's the truth of the gospel. God has seen your movie and he loves you. Do you get that? God has seen your movie. There's nothing you've ever done that God doesn't know about. He loves you. God is moving even when you can't see him. God is in control even when things seem out of control. Which brings me to my final thing I know to be true. When you think it is all over with God, it is just beginning. I believe that as deep as the marrow in my bones. I'll never forget, first morning I had to meet with my doctor, with my psychiatrist. And he said, who are you? And I said, "Um, Sheila Walsh. And he said, no, I know that, Sheila. Who are you? I said, I'm the co-host of the 700 Club. He said, no, I didn't ask what your job description was. I asked, who are you? And I said, I have no idea. And it was the beginning of God peeling away everything that I had kept around myself to make me safe, to help me understand that he saw me as I really am and loves me as I really am. After I'd been in the hospital for three, four weeks, the doctor said, I'd like you to take a trip outside the hospital. You can go to a movie, you can go to the mall, I'll send a young nurse with you. And I said, no, I'd just like to go to church. I don't care which denomination, if it's a Bible-believing church. And I sat in the very back row, lost. And I don't remember the whole message that morning, but I do remember this. The pastor said at the end, some of you feel as if you're dead inside. You can almost hear them begin to heap the earth on top of you. And he said, I want you to know one thing. Jesus is here. And you don't have to get yourself out of that hole. You simply have to call on his name and he will reach in and grab hold of you and pull you free. At the end of that service, I didn't know what people did in that church, but I ran to the front and I lay face down in front of the cross. And a hymn that my grandmother used to sing to me when I was just a little girl, the words came back and I understood them for the very first time. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. But these two lines, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. And I finally got it. I'm not the good news Jesus is. When I left that hospital and the doctor called across the parking lot, Sheila, who are you? I said, I'm Sheila Walsh, daughter of the King of Kings. I don't know what label you came in here wearing today, but you are not what happened to you. You are not the divorced dad, the single mom, the overweight person, the bankrupt person. You are not that. Those are not who you are. Who you are when you've trusted in Jesus, you can say, I am a child of God. That is my identity. You know, there's a little church way up in the north of Scotland, sweet pastor, But one night the elder said to him, you know, you might think of retiring pastor. We've not had many salvations this year. And he said, well, don't forget about Jimmy. Jimmy's 15, wandered into church a few weeks before that and listening to the message of a God who saw him as he was and invited him to come just as he was. Jimmy got it and he gave his life to Christ that night. So it's a few weeks later and Jimmy's at the Sunday evening service sitting right at the end And when they begin to pass the offering plate, Jimmy says, could you put it on the floor? And the the deacon said, no, no, Jimmy, just pass it along the row. Doesn't matter if you don't have anything, just pass it along. And Jimmy said, no, please, would you put it on the floor? So he said, okay. So he put the offering plate on the floor and Jimmy stepped in. I don't have a lot, Lord, but I'm all in till it's all over. I give you every bit of me. I'm all in. That's my heart. I'm all in till this is all over. But I want you to know that God sees you right now. And if you have never given your heart to Jesus, this is not about religion. God hates religion. This is about relationship. It's about a relationship with a God who is crazy about you. If you have never prayed that prayer, 
could I lead you? There's nothing special about my words. But if you want to know this Jesus, then just pray line by line after me. Simple prayer, wherever you are, just say, Father God, thank you for loving me. Jesus Christ, thank you for dying for me. I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I want to live a new life. But thank you that I get to come as I am. Thank you for loving me. It's given me a new hope and a future. In Jesus' name. Now, if I know we've passed the cards earlier on, but you can grab a card in the lobby of any of the campuses. And just, if you prayed that prayer, fill it in, because we'd love to send you a book. If there's anything we can do to, to pray for you and support you, or if today you want to say, you know, I'm dropping my baggage. I'm leaving all that stuff behind. Today, I'm going to stand up and be a daughter, a son of the Most High God, because I am loved and invited to come just as I am. God bless you all. Go, go ahead and stay standing. A lot of you already popped up. Everybody stand to your feet, if you will. Why don't you repeat after me? I am a beloved child of the Most High God. Now say it like you really mean it. I am a beloved child of the Most High God. Only God could have orchestrated the timing of that message after the Vision Day message last week. What'd she say? I'm all in until it's all over? What? I'm all in. And if you remember last week, I threw that word change up here and I said, we're never gonna take our foot off the pedal to reach people for Jesus. Amen? But I said last week, it's time that we shift, pivot, if you will, and really go all in in this thing called discipleship. That's what she's talking about. And so in two weeks, we're starting that series and she already said, we already collected the cards, which is fine. But if you want to get involved in a life group or a mid-sized group for the study Wrecked and Redeemed, we're going to have a big mid-sized group right here at the Durham campus. Just grab that card, mark it on your card. Just say mid-sized group or life group or book, you know, or gift. I just got saved. And we'll get that to you. Or you do it next week. But I'm just going to keep letting you know this next season it's all about us deciding, you know what? I'm tired of playing games. I'm tired of playing religious games, which as she just said, God can't stand religious games. So we're inviting you in her language to go all in until it's all over. And then guess what? The best is only yet to come then. Then we're going to heaven. Then we're going to heaven. And we're going to see him face to face. <laughs> Sheila requested a song, one of her favorite songs. She requested it. And she didn't know that it was one of our favorite songs too. And we haven't done it in a little while, but it's a good one. So just stand to your feet. Stay on your feet, I should say. And let's sing out, I will rise. Say that with me. I will rise. One more time. I will rise rise. Father God, be inhabited in our praises today. We love you. We exalt you. Thank you for such a timely word. God, would you bless the servant who has brought it to us? And would you bless us as we apply it and live it out? And you continue to anoint this church for great things ahead to your glory and honor and praise in Jesus name. Amen.